Thank you. Good evening, Peg. Welcome. Good evening, counselors. Hi. Um, Go ahead. All right. So, thank you for allowing me to present this item quickly. Uh, typically, we would have already been awarded the fiscal year 20 funds. We're six months late. They've allowed that extra six months in the contract. If you noticed the. The performance date goes from January 1st through to July, uh, to June of 2022. Uh, in your application, or 2020, 2022, in your application, you applied for $60,000 for housing and code enforcement, which funds 100% of a part-time code enforcement officer for the, the building inspection. And you uh, are funding 60% of the health code enforcement officer. Uh, we are applying for the, or excuse me, we're being awarded for the West Street infrastructure, and we're doing the parks and playgrounds at McCann Field. We'll be doing fencing at the backfield, a new backstop netting in the front field, shade structures uh, at the dugout, a uh, new scoreboard, and um, uh, the program delivery and administration funds will be covered under that. Thank you. Any further discussion on this? Enough. Roll call. Councillor Adams. Yes. Councillor Catrano. Councillor Catrano. Councillor Danny. Yes. Councillor Dow. Yes. Councillor Jolene. Yes. Councillor Lazo. Yes. Councillor Marchetti. Yes. Councilor Ryan? Yes. Councilor Steve? Yes. And Councilor Catrona? Yes. Motion carries. Well, that was quick, Peg. Thank you. <laughs> Item 18. Uh, discuss the status of the dangerous dog can sent to Mr. Uh, Donald Zelinski. This was a circle back that he had a training plan uh, requirement that we would make sure that we had it on the agenda. Uh, to make sure that he had followed through on the training plan. I believe everybody was forwarded that information. Uh, Chief uh, Woodson, do you have anything to add? I know Caitlin's here as well. Anybody has any questions? Um, it was just to make sure that they had followed through. So, Chief Woodson? Uh, three, Mr. Chair, I do not have anything to add, and I, I defer uh, to Ms. Spencer, who's here. Caitlin? Uh, good evening, everybody. Um, I reviewed over the training program. I do think it's a strong program that was presented. Um, I did have them change a couple things on the initial thing to include in-person training because the original one didn't mention uh, Mr. Flora is coming to town to do the training. Um, I also made sure that they included training tools. The one thing I would have to get back to them that I'm just noticing is there's no mention of a four foot um, tether that uh, Councillor Adams was requesting that to be attached to Donald. Um, but I'm pretty sure that will be something that they'll incorporate during the training. Other than that, um, I think it's something that is obtainable and hopefully that they'll be successful at. Okay, thank you. That tether was actually a part of the original order, so that was part of the requirements of the order. So it wouldn't be part of that training plan anyway. So it was a requirement of the rest of the order. This was specific to the training plan, making sure that they had submitted the training plan to you, So, which they did, correct? They did. Uh, I just noticed because they just they mentioned a three-foot harness um, tether, so that's probably why I was wondering why the four-foot was not mentioned. Yeah. Okay. Any questions? Um, I just had a correspondence from the attorney Corbo that was uh, uh, present at that. He would just state that we should move that the council approved the training plan submitted by Mr. Zelinsky and his team and approved by the animal control officer and that the plan be incorporated into and may be part of the council's January 28, 2021 order. Can I get a motion on that? So moved. Second. I'll second it. Any discussion on that? Mary, I'll get that specific language to Councilor Steves. Yeah, one quick question on the plan. 
Um, under at the very bottom, it talks about doing role play if possible with willing participants and per CDC guidelines. What are the CDC guidelines for dog training? I have no idea what those would be. I think the CDC guidelines have to do with the COVID nineteen pandemic guidelines, not specific to animal oh, control. Okay. okay. Would you uh, interpret it as chief? Would you interpret it that way? Is that what you mean? Correct. Okay. Okay. Just checking. Yeah. I figure it's a dog plant that's not really subject to COVID nineteen. So okay. But the uh, trainers would be, and any other participants. Any further discussion? Roll call. Councillor Catrano? No. Councillor Daniel? Yes. Councillor Dow? Yes. Councillor Jovian? Yes. Councillor Lazo? No. Councillor Marchetti? No. Councillor Ryan? Yes. Councillor Steves? Yes. And Councillor Adams? Yes. Motion carries six to three. Item 19, the deletion of the indemnification IOD bylaw review board article XVI. This is the third and final reading. Any comments? Discussion on the deletion of this bylaw? Does anybody have any questions to the town managers relative to the bylaw deletion? Council Catrona? Just quickly, Mr. Chairman, this is a deletion, so there's really nothing to read, correct? Correct, but it is a change in the bylaw, so there's a reading. You have to announce that you are doing this, so there's nothing to read because it's being deleted. Okay, thank you. So. Council Steves? Yeah, just a quick clarification there. The text actually says it's it's, set, it's section, or article 17, not 16. 17, okay. Any further questions on that? And then item 20, vote to approve the deletion of the indemnification IOD bylaw review board article 17. So moved. So moved. A second. Okay. Second. Any, any other discussion? Um, uh, this is Tom Manager. Um, through you, Mr. Chair, and to the, the rest of the council, um, Councilor Marchetti uh, asked me a question during the course of the week, which I've been trying to get an answer to him and to, to all of the council, but um, apparently the collective bargaining agreement with the fire department does point out in article or section eight, uh, it does talk about what happens, the process uh, when a firefighter is injured on duty, and it makes uh, specific reference to the indemnification board. As I previously indicated, I did have conversations with the presidents of the respective police and fire unions and they were able to say verbally that they did not have an issue with us going forward. I, I did speak again to uh, firefighter Gary Peck, who is the president of the fire union. He said they are meeting tomorrow night and that I asked specifically if they would look at vote, voting on this particular issue and then providing me with a letter saying that they had no issue with the wording uh, as it currently is, and we would interpret the board just to be essentially the town manager if we delete it, and that it could be addressed when we enter negotiations at the end of this current term. So I, I leave it to, to the council whether or not they would like to wait one more uh, meeting to, to see that letter if that presents a, an issue. Otherwise, you could proceed this evening. Council Ryan. Thank you, Mr. Chair, through you to the town manager. Um, actually, it was almost like you were reading my mind, um, uh, Manager McCall. Um, that, that was um, something I was thinking as you were reading that I would feel more comfortable um, since it's in their specific contract having um, a vote from them saying that they're fine with this before moving forward just as a final clarification. Thank you. And as I said, Mr. Chairman, they're scheduled to have the meeting uh, tomorrow night, and I did trade emails with uh, the fire union president today, and he said that they would address this issue tomorrow. Thank you, Councilor Steves. You're muted. You're muted. Councilor Steves, you're muted. Uh, 
I'm sorry. Have you, have you, uh, this would also affect the police unit. Have you talked to them too? I, I did, if I, uh, through you, uh, Chairman Joman, I did speak to them previously, but I, I don't, I looked after Council Marchetti brought this to my attention. I did look and I did not see that it's called out in the similar section in their contract. So um, they gave me, um, without a formal vote, they said that they, they surveyed randomly and they did not see a problem. Um, depending upon how long you want to wait, I could see when their, their next union meeting was. It, it's just that I had already talked to the fire union about it because it specifically is called out in their contract. Yeah, uh, Chief is here. I know I've looked through those contracts and it is different between the police and fire contracts, but Chief Woodson? If I could, through you, Mr. Chair, there's no language in our contract. Our union has no issues. You, you don't need to contact them. They're, they're on board. Thank you. So uh, with that, I guess I'd entertain a motion just to postpone and hold the uh, final vote to the meeting of 2-22-2021. Oh, no. Motion is second. Roll call. Councilor Daniel. Yes. Councilor Dow. Yes. Councilor Jovan. Yes. Councilor Lapo. Yes. Councilor Marcelli. Yes. Councilor Ryan. Yes. Councilor Steve. Yes. Councilor Adams. Yes. And Councilor Catrona. Yes. We'll uh, take the final vote at the room meeting. Everyone, amendments to the subject one of bylaw introduced in added section nine uh, three American optical flex overlays zone. Second reading. So I guess we'll go over to gets Councilor Steve. This is, have you received any uh, further input into the first reading or amendments? Um, I have not, although I know Councillor Marchetti did put a, did record at least some of these. I don't know if you finished all of them. And honestly, I think it would be a good idea if we if we need if has has it gone up on cable or anything like that. What's that? I mean, I'm sorry. As far as in, I know, Councillor Marchetti had actually taken the time to read them all um, on video, and I don't necessarily think it. If we can, if he could, if he we could play that, I don't think we necessarily need to read it. Uh, play, play it tonight. tonight. As, now, I, I, I'm, I'm trying to get clarification of what your process wants to be. This is a reading, so we either read it or we waive the reading or we uh, announce to other uh, the public how they may hear or, or do this. Council Lazo? Um, i just like to comment on these readings. Um, back in the day, in the late 80s, we used to do the same thing, the three readings. Um, and it was kind of agreed. I mean, the charter has changed over the years. I'm a little rusty on all the stuff that happens now, and we're getting up on it. But what we used to do back then um, was waive the first reading, waive the second reading, then read it on the third reading. And we almost had a gentleman's agreement on council with 13 councillors that we used to amendments were all made on the third reading. So it uh, was a clean cut run of two waves. And then after you read it on the third reading, and if you recorded or read it and can do it in that manner, I wouldn't have a problem with that, that uh, Gus was talking about. Um, but to read it three times, um, I know we as a council, 13 councils, never did that. I, I don't recall that. Um, so for me, I mean, I'm, I'm up for it. I know that this is posted and it's in the town hall and but with covert and everything. I mean, you know, reading it on the last, on the third reading, I thought was standard procedure back when in the late eighties, early nineties, but uh, times have changed. I'm open for uh, discussion. This is a reading. Uh, so I, I guess we either had a motion to waive the reading for the second reading or if there's an opposition to that as per the guidance from our legal counsel if there's an opposition from one or more counselors then we read the the uh the uh i'll, make a, formal, I'll make a formal motion to waive the read second reading i'll second it okay discussion. discussion on waiving the readings council marchetti thank you mr chairman through you um actually i think uh, 
making a motion to waive the reading is out of order because it is in the charter. It, I don't know what you did out in the 80s or the 70s or whatever, but the charter does say that we have to read the bylaws at three, at three meetings. Now, I know at the last meeting I, I also voted to waive it, so I'm not going to try to rescind that, although we probably should, but um, we should read these bylaws, and that's just the way the charter, that's what the charter says. I don't think as uh, town councilors, we should just, uh, you know, decide to ignore the charter. It's what we live by the charter. We are, we are ruled by the town charter. Now, I did ask for the memo from the attorney uh, on what his ruling was, why we were waiving these, and his ruling was that uh, he said reading is not actually mean reading. And uh, I thought that was that was hogwash, really, is what I thought. But what he what he was basing that on was that uh, the state legislators don't read their bills, but the state legislators the state legislators are governed by by the uh, con state constitution. We're governed by the charter, and there's a big difference there. So I don't think we are really even allowed to make a motion to to waive. The charter says it has to be read. It has to be read. Um, I did record all of them. It's probably going to take about an hour and a half to read all three of them, but I did record them. And I don't see anything wrong with just playing the recording. A reading is a reading. So, but that's all. Thank you. Pastor John. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Interesting that we come to this point. Um, I certainly hear the last two counselors. Uh, I did just pull up the charter 2-6-3 two, two and I also did vote the last meeting to waive. However, the charter does state 2-6-3 every bylaw shall be read at three separate meetings before its passage. Thank, the, thank you to the town manager for sending us this opinion from October 15, 2018. It looks like um, it was requested by you, Mr. Chair. And as we all know, an opinion is just that. It's an opinion. I can get a legal opinion if I wanted to that the sun's not going to come out tomorrow. If I wanted to, I'm sure I could get someone to agree. You can't compare a legislative process in Boston to Southbridge. Boston can do almost anything. Here, and I just pulled out, we're bound by the charter. 2-6-3, every bylaw shall be read at three separate meetings before its passage. So, much like Councilor Marchetti just said, I'm not looking to rescind my prior vote, but we are bound by a charter. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So, first off, I did not go shopping for an opinion, Councilor. I never Agreed. said that, Mr. I, Chairman. No. You your your name, that. this says, Dear Mr. Chairman, Jack Jovan, Chairman, Let me South finish Town Council. Council. I have the floor right now. You have the floor, I have the floor. Okay, go With ahead. With respect. You alluded to the fact that you could get an opinion to say something was something. So that goes to the point that I may have shopped around for an opinion. I was asked back then in 2015, you were not on the council at that time, to explore that option. That was the opinion that went out at that time, shared with other councilors. It was not hitting by anybody shared publicly at a council meeting. I have no, if somebody wants to read that, that's fine. I, I, I it's all for due process. I just want to make sure that um, we use our time efficiently. If there was other ways for people to know what exactly we're voting on, that we get that information out to them. I.e., there's a, times have changed when this charter was first written and hopefully our charter review committee can work on this specific issue because times have changed in the past you did not have the luxury of social media or internet or the ability to get mass communication out there quickly for people to digest the information so that was the old language of trying to say you're going to read these because people will listen to it if we want to go by the strict interpretation of the chart and everything is open to interpretation my good friend mr smick always says Things are open to interpretation. Even the charter is open to the interpretation of what the framers want. 
the question before you is, do you want to waive it or not? So if somebody opposes it and wants to read it, then we read it. There was no different than what we took place before in a reading for the keeper of the pets bylaw. When somebody opposed it, we gladly read it after waiving it two other times. So the question before you is a motion in a second to waive the reading. That's the question before us. So, Council Lazo. Just a quick question. I'm not going to debate the charter and whether the legislature can do this or that. Legislature has their own little thing that governs them, like we have our charter governing us. And I, and I don't think anybody will disagree with the two previous speakers. Um, what's the upside to reading it three times? There isn't one. Okay? So it needs to be changed. The charter needs to be changed. And if we want to get technical, which we pick and choose when we're technical, then we'll, we'll do that. Just object, and then you can read it. Uh, but my thing is, what is the intent of government to amend something is to streamline it where it's transparent and it works. And sometimes people in government or people that write the charter or amend the charter, a bunch of windbags. And uh, that's what I think this turns into. Thank you. Thank you. Motion a second to read the reading. Roll call. Councilor Jovan? Yes. Councilor Lazo? Yes. Councilor Marchetti? No. Councilor Ryan? Yeah, you don't have to read the roll oh. any longer. Okay. The roll any longer. Somebody opposed. Okay. Councilor Marchetti, you said you have a way to do this? Otherwise, point of order, Mr. Read. Chair. Point There's of order? No, what is your point of order? State your point of order. To continue the roll. There's no need to because one council already opposed. So therefore, when one council opposes, based on the record. Of, okay, for the record, go ahead. Okay. Uh, Run the roll again. Mr. Chairman, there was a point of order. And the point of order is stating that you're out of order. Were you out of order by making that call? I'm not sure you were out of order. I don't believe I was out of order because... Uh, the role, being a the gentleman, role. is that what you're doing? What's that? Are you being a gentleman? Is that what you're doing? I am being a gentleman, yes, because I'm not going to oh, get a debate over just roll a call. Point of clarification. We began a roll call. No, the gentleman. Why oh, you... Gentlemen, we began, a, Ms. Councilor Lazo, and to Mr. Chairman, we began a roll call. I just believe it should be finished. Reason for my, de reason for my decision is that the opinion says when one counselor opposes that, therefore the entire thing has to be read. In the fact that one council has opposed, what is the, unless you want to have a on the record so people can see you stand there and say, I oppose, that's fine. If that's what you want, that's fine. I, I, I don't want to turn this into a debate, Mr. Chair. I have the floor, Council Katrona. I have the floor. I have the floor, Council Katrona. I'm making a decision. Well, I will that's... recognize you after you're done. The council of Marchetti, the ruling was from the council, the attorney, Council Marchetti can read it if he wants, states that when one council opposes, therefore you have to read it and put it into the record. Council Marchetti opposed, there's no reason to run the rest of the call. But if you want it for the record, I'm in a gentleman, as my friend Council Lazo stated, I'll run the roll call again so that you can have it. So run the roll again. Thank, Thank you. you, Mr. Chairman. If I can just speak to that, as you just stated, this is... I'm running a roll, Councilor Catrona. You're out is, of order. This is, no, this order. is an opinion. This is an you're opinion. There's, Council, no judge, there's no judge that ruled on this. Councilor Catrona is out of order. Run roll call, please. Councilor Adams? Yes. Councillor Katrona. Councillor Katrona. Councillor Daniel. Mr. Chairman, yes. did you did you mute Mr. Katrona? He's, he's unmuted on this. He's unmuted. He's okay. unmuted. His light is green, so I don't know what's the matter. 
looks like a no he's mouthing, so I'll put a no for now. We can put it in the chat. That's fine. Counselor Dow? Yes. Counselor Jovan? Yes. Uh, so we have the reading, yes. Counselor Lazo? Yes. Counselor Marchetti? No. Counselor Ryan? No. And Counselor Steves? No. So Marchetti, are you going to do the reading? Is that what you're doing? If you make me a presenter, I can I can play the re the reading. Hopefully, it'll work. Hey, hold on, I just got in. I mean, we did give it a quick test after Gen Gov, and it did work for a couple of minutes there, so it should work. Thank you, Tom. The Marchetti, you are the presenter. All right, thank you. Section 9.3, American Optical Flex Overlay District. Section 9.3.1, Intent. A, the intent of the American Optical Flex Overlay District, hereinafter referred to as AO Fold, is to provide the opportunity to fully utilize former mill structures and related properties that are part of the town's landscape, character, and history. They are also places of economic activity and economic opportunity. Specifically, this bylaw is intended to, one, provide maximum flexibility for the development and enhancement of AO fold properties. Two, retain the potential for business and industrial development while permitting residential development. Three, foster a greater opportunity for creative development, which encourage a mix of uses, residential, commercial, and industrial. Four, enhance business vitality and provide employment opportunities. Five, enhance and protect the town tax revenues. And six, encourage the development of flexible space for small and emerging businesses. Section 9.3.2, general requirements. A, all uses shall be served by public water and sewer. B, all developments shall be reviewed for compatibility with the Southbridge Master Plan and be supportive of the public health, general welfare, and safety of the community, including adequate provisions of public facilities and a minimum number of access points on existing roads. C, the board may, at its discretion, hire a third-party consultant, also acceptable to the applicant, to aid the board in its review of any proposed use or site. The fees charged by the third-party consultant shall be borne by the applicant. D, uses currently allowed by special permit may continue. Uses allowed by right in the underlying zone may be developed by the securing of a site plan review through the planning board. Any changes to a special permit use will require a new special permit complying with these bylaws. Section 9.3.3, allowable uses by special permit. A, all industrial, commercial, and residential uses not prohibited under Section 9.3.4, subject to the performance and compatibility standards in Section 9.3.5 of this section and the application and permitting requirements of subsection 9.3.6 are permitted by special permit. B, within the AO fold, there shall be no restriction on combining different categories of use, provided such uses conform with the compatibility and performance standards found in section 9.3.5 within the same building except any imposed by the state building code or other federal, state, or local bylaws. C. An erosion and sedimentation control plan shall be required when the proposed development will result in a disturbed area that is cumulatively more than one half acre in size or when the board determines that special site conditions warrant such a plan. Section 9.3.4 Prohibited Uses A. Adult Entertainment Uses B. Animal Sales on Properties of Less Than Five Acres C. Animal agriculture on properties of less than five acres. D. Automobile or truck sales. E. Bulk storage or manufacture of materials or products that could decompose by detonation. F. Camps. Day slash boarding. G. Car wash. H. Cemeteries. I. Collection centers. J. Dog kennels. K. Drive up services associated with any commercial use other than banks. L. Golf courses. M. Letting of rooms. N, a facility that contains or conducts research involving biological safety level 3 or the equivalent term risk group 3, classification or higher. O, rendering. P, rooming and or boarding house excluding dormitories for educational uses. Q, seasonal camping slash tents. R, service station. Section 9.3.5, Performance and Compatibility Standards. A, Compatibility. 1. All new uses.
uses shall demonstrate to the satisfaction of the board that any such new uses, in addition to meeting the requirements of this section, are compatible with all existing uses. A. Any new buildings or accessory structures shall relate harmoniously to each other with adequate light, air circulation, separation between buildings, and to the extent practicable, shall be in harmony with the existing district. B. Building or structures that are listed on the National Register of Historic Places shall be converted, constructed, reconstructed, restored, or altered to maintain or promote the status of a building or structure on the state or national register of historic places. B. Access and traffic impacts. 1. Traffic and safety impacts to the existing and proposed roads shall be minimized. 2. Access shall be provided to the extent feasible through an existing street or driveway. Curb cuts shall be limited. 3. Pedestrian and vehicular traffic shall be separated. 4. Walkways shall be provided for access to adjacent properties and between businesses. C. Nuisance avoidance. 1. Uses shall cause no inherent and recurring generated vibration perceptible without instruments at any point between two or more uses or along a property line. Temporary construction is excluded from this restriction. 2. Smoke shall not be visible beyond a shade or darker than number 1 on the Ringelman smoke chart. 3. Heat and glare generated from within a structure or use shall not be discernible from the outside of any structure. 4. Odor, dust, and fumes shall be effectively combined to the premises or so disposed as to avoid air pollution. 5. No activities involving bulk storage or manufacture of materials or products that could decompose by detonation shall be permitted. These materials include primary explosives such as lead, azide, fulminates, lead, styphonate, and tetracine. High explosives such as TNT, RDX, HMX, PETN, and picric acid, propellants, and their components such as dry nitrocellulose, black powder, boron hydrides, and hydrazine and its derivatives, pyrotechnics and fireworks such as magnesium powder, potassium chlorate, potassium nitrate, blasting explosives such as dynamites and nitroglycerin, unstable organic compounds such as acetylides, tetrazoles, and ozonides, strong oxidizing agents such as liquid oxygen, perchloric acid, perchlorates, chlorates, and hydrogen peroxide in concentrations greater than 35% and nuclear fuels, fissionable materials and products and reactor elements such as uranium 23S and plutonium 239. Utilization of the materials included this in this section shall be limited to the minimum quantities necessary for specific research and only after the procurement of all required local, state, and federal permits. Material type, quantity, storage, handling procedures and location in the facility shall also be registered with the fire department, police department, and the Southridge Planning Board. All local, state, and federal disposal procedures must be followed. Six, any electrical radiation shall not adversely affect at any point any operations or any equipment, including not only professional research equipment, but also equipment reserved for personal uses, such as reception of public radio transmissions, use of cellular phones, etc., except equipment belonging to the creator of the electrical radiation. All FCC rules and regulations must be followed. Seven, no use abutting residential use shall engage in or cause very loud activities as defined in the Town of Southbridge Code of Ordinances, Section 7-503, between the hours of 9 p.m. of one day and 7 a.m. of the following day. 8. Non-residential uses shall be designed, constructed, and operated and hours of operation limited where appropriate, so that neighboring residents are not exposed to offensive noise, especially from traffic or late-night activity. No amplified music shall be audible to neighboring residents. 9. Common walls between residential and non-residential uses shall be constructed to minimize the transmission of noise and vibration. D. Lighting. A lighting plan allowing existing and proposed exterior lighting, including building and ground lighting, locations, supports, mounting heights, and orientation of all luminaires and light distribution pattern is required. Two, parking areas and pedestrian facilities shall be illuminated to provide appropriate visibility and security during hours of darkness. Three, exterior lighting shall be architecturally integrated with the building style, material, and colors. Four, exterior lighting of the building and site shall be designed so that light is not directed off the site, including above the site and the light source is shielded from direct off-site viewing. Five, fixture mounting height should be appropriate for the project and the setting. Use of low bollard type fixtures three to four feet in height is encouraged as pedestrian area light. The mounting height of fixtures in smaller parking lots or service areas should not exceed 16 feet with lower mounting heights encouraged, particularly where adjacent to residential areas. 6. Raised light pole bases shall be attractively designed and well detailed to be compatible with the overall project. 7. The use of vandal-resistant well lighting is encouraged for lighting monument signs.
E. Residential use restriction. One. Residential buildings to be constructed or rehabilitated shall be designed to filter out noise and vibration through construction, employing, but not limited to, such techniques as applying soundproofing material between dwelling units laterally and vertically and between different uses, employing staggered joists and insulation. Two. Residential density will be limited to the density of the abutting residential zone districts when within 50 feet. When two or more districts abut the AO fold project, the highest allowable density shall prevail. Three. Residential uses apartment and condominium units shall be permitted in existing structures and shall consist of not less than 500 square feet of livable space. F. Buffers, density, and height. 1. Where an AOFO property abuts a residential zone property, a buffer strip of 75 feet shall be required for any new non-residential development. Such buffers shall be planted with year-round screening vegetation adequate to buffer the view from the residential zone. Preservation of existing trees and vegetation is preferred where they provide desired screening. 2. Where the a O fold abuts a residentially zoned property, a buffer strip of 25 feet shall be required for any new residential development. 3. To reduce the bulk and area of buildings and pavement relative to the overall size of the development and to provide landscape areas for visual and sound buffers, increased groundwater recharge, and reduced stormwater runoff, the total area of any AO fold that may be covered by buildings and paved surfaces shall not exceed 50%. The board may allow by special permit an increase to a maximum of 60% percent impervious coverage when the board finds that one or more of the following benefits of the development outweigh the impacts of the increased impervious coverage. A. The use of grass slash pavement block systems or similar treatment reduces storm water runoff and or B. The development achieves an overall benefit to the community such as elimination of blight conditions, preservation of historic structures, closure of excessive curb cuts, provisions of inter-parcel access or service roads or similar benefit. 4. Maximum building heights for new construction shall be as follows. A. Residential. 35 feet may be higher upon approval by the fire chief and the planning board. B. Commercial, 60 feet. C. Industrial, 60 feet. D. Mixed use. 60 feet. 5. For existing structures, A. Telecommunication facilities, water tanks, solar collection systems, similar structures and necessary mechanical appurtenances may be erected on an existing structure to a higher greater than the limit established for the AO fold, provided that no such exception shall cover at any level more than 25% of the area of the roof on which it is located, except for a solar collection system which may cover more than 25% of the area of the roof on which it is located if the architectural design and layout is compatible with that of the structure to which it is affixed and generally in keeping with the character of the neighborhood in which it is to be situated and provided further that no such exception shall be used for residential, commercial, or industrial purposes other than such as may be incidental to the permitted use of the main structure. B. Roof structures and or roof lines may be integrated together where more than one roof line or roof style is present. 6. The height limitations of these bylaws for new construction shall not apply to chimneys, cables, cupolas, Spires, water towers, flagpole, transmission towers and cables, radio or television, tenny or towers or telecommunication service facilities, provided that the telecommunication facility and its antennas or associated equipment does not extend more than five feet above the highest point of the building or structure to which it is attached. G. Outdoor storage and sales display. 1. Except as specified below, outdoor storage or display of goods shall be enclosed within permanent walls or fences integrated into the design of the building. A. Storage or display rack and goods thereon shall not exceed the height of screening walls or fences. B. Goods shall not be displayed in landscaped areas on external walls or in parking lots. C. The board, at its sole discretion, may permit the outdoor display and sale of merchandise on sidewalks if a written request accompanies the application stating the nature of the outdoor sales, including the location, duration, and types of merchandise to be sold. D. Outdoor display areas shall be delineated on the site plan and or concept plan and shall not impede the normal use of sidewalks or or other pedestrian walkways. E. No vending machines shall be allowed outside of any buildings. F. All materials, supplies, and equipment shall be stored in accordance with fire prevention standards of the National Board of Fire Underwriters and shall be screened from view from public ways and abutting properties. H. Waste disposal. 1. Garbage or recycling dumpsters slash compactors shall have doors or lids that shall remain closed when not being loaded or unloaded and shall be contained in masonry enclosures supplemented with landscaping if necessary. 2. No delivery Delivery loading, trash removal, compaction, or other similar operations shall be permitted between the hours of 8 p.m. and 6 a.m. unless the applicant submits evidence.
evidence that sound barriers between all areas for such operations effectively reduce noise emissions. I. Signs. 1. Signs shall conform to section 8.9 for each use on the site and, in addition to those requirements, the following. A. All signs shall be architecturally integrated with their surroundings in terms of size, shape, color, texture, and lighting so that they are complementary to the overall design of the building and are not in visual competition with other signs in the area. B. Signs shall be proportionate to the dimensions of their location. C. All signs shall complement the surroundings without competing with each other, shall convey their message clearly and legibly, shall be vandal-proof and weather-resistant, and if illuminated, shall not be overly bright for their surroundings. All signs, save for wayfinding signs, must be externally lit. D. Exterior lighting of the building and site shall be designed so that light is not directed off the site and the light source is shielded from direct off-site viewing. E. New signs proposed for existing buildings shall provide a compatible appearance with the building signage of other tenants. With multiple signs on a single building, attempt to bring in a unifying element, such as size, even where no sign program exists. F. New construction design shall anticipate signage and, where necessary, a sign program. New building design should provide logical sign areas, following flexibility for new uses, users as the building is retenanted over time. Designs which provide for convenient and attractive replacement of signs are encouraged. G. The use of roof signs shall be prohibited. H. Freestanding signs shall not be greater than five feet in height. Monument sign materials shall reflect the character of the use and the building the sign identifies. I. Freestanding sign bases shall be made of permanent durable materials such as concrete or brick. Bases made of texture coated sheet metal are discouraged. J. Landscaping and irrigation shall be designed around the base of freestanding signs to integrate the sign with the ground plane and screen out any low level flood lights. Irrigation shall be designed so it does not damage the sign. K. Freestanding signs on poles which have a top heavy appearance are discouraged. L. Driveway directional signs shall only be used for projects where circulation is complex and the traffic must proceed through the site along a specific path for service. Where the layout of the parking lot and driveways are obvious and clearly apparent to the driver entering from the street, directional signage is not appropriate. When not appropriate or needed, such signage can visually clutter the site and will be discouraged. M. Any external spot or flood lighting shall be arranged so that the light source is screened from direct view by passersby and so that the light is directed against the sign and does not shine into adjacent property or blind motorists and pedestrians. J. Landscaping requirement. 1. Existing trees shall be maintained as practicable, and any new trees shall be carefully selected and located where they will complement the building elevation and shall not block all retail storefront signage from view. 2. Screening of mechanical equipment, trash, and loading areas shall be provided through the use of walls, fences, and or dense evergreen plant materials. 3. Landscaping and screening plant materials shall not encroach on the public walkways or roadways in a way that impedes pedestrian or vehicular traffic. 4. Shrubs or trees that die shall be replaced within one growing season. 5. All new plant materials shall be sized so that the landscaping has an attractive appearance at the time of installation and a mature appearance within three years of planting. 6. All proposed shrubs except accent, color, or ground cover planting shall be a minimum of five gallon size. Shrubs and ground cover plants shall be spaced close enough to to ensure an attractive and mature planting effect. 7. Energy conservation within structures shall be addressed by recognizing the sun exposure on the site and providing or maintaining appropriate tree species. Deciduous trees on the southern exposure, coniferous and broadleaf evergreen trees along the eastern and western exposure, and evergreens along the northern exposure. 8. Tree species, when additional trees are proposed, should be selected with root growth habits that will not cause damage to sidewalks, or such tree species shall be sited away from such landscaped areas. 9. Landscaping plans shall show all obstructions such as street light meters, backflow devices, utility covers, transformers, and similar objects which may affect plant placement and installation limitations. 10. When constructing new landscape planting areas on surfaces which were previously covered by pavement or structure, all existing asphalt-based rock or other deleterious materials shall be removed to the depth of the native soil and clean soil shall be used for backfill of the area. 11. All exposed dirt areas shall be covered with bark or mulch or other weed control measures, including as part of final landscape. 12. Street tree placement shall include consideration for vehicle line of sight, entrance and exit curb cuts, street light and traffic control devices, and other site-specific conditions as part of design review process. 13. First year plantings must be watered weekly throughout the growing season. K. Parking and loading areas. 
requirements. One, parking shall conform to section 7.1 and additionally shall meet the following standards. A, parking lots shall provide well-defined routes for vehicles, delivery trucks, and pedestrians. B, loading areas visible from public street or adjacent property shall be screened with masonry walls supplemented by landscaping if necessary. C, to the maximum extent feasible, landscaped islands with raised curves shall be used to define parking lot entrances, the ends of parking aisles, and the location and pattern of primary driveways and to provide pedestrian walkways where appropriate. D. Parking areas shall be screened from adjacent residential uses, streets, and walkways using trees and shrubs adapted to the region of specimen quality conforming to the American Standard for Nursery Stock, American Standards Institute Incorporated, 230 Southern Building, Washington, D.C., 20005, and shall be planted according to accepted horticultural standards. Berms may be used for screening along the street in conjunction with plant materials. E. Where a mix of uses creates staggered peak periods of parking demand, shared parking calculations shall be submitted to reduce total required parking. A reserve area for future development shall be provided on the site plan. F. The use of porous pavement and or perforated brick or block shall be used to the extent feasible to increase on-site water retention for plant material, groundwater supplies, and to reduce problems associated with runoff. G. Within the town's right-of-way, all curbing shall be constructed of granite. L. Medical and or biological research. 1. In the establishment, operation, and design of medical and biological research laboratories and facilities with standards and procedures, as amended, of the National Institute of Health, Bethesda, Maryland, and Centers for Disease Control will apply. No facility shall contain or conduct research involving biological safety level 3, or the equivalent term risk group 3, classification or higher. Section 9.3.6, Applications and Permit Procedures. A. Before an application is made, it is suggested that the applicant become familiar with the bylaws contained in this section, as well as those contained in Section 2.5, which addresses special permits, and Section 2.6, which addresses site plan, to consult with the planning board and or planning office for other bylaws to consider and for any clarifications. B. There are two application procedures for development in the AO phone. 1. A concept plan application for the entire AO phone property with without a special permit application for specific land uses to be reviewed by the development review team and presented to the planning board for review and comments, and two, a special permit application for each proposed use within the AO fold. C. Concept planned application. One. Purpose. The concept plan is intended to illustrate the general development plan and expected land uses without requiring the detail and expense of the site plan required as a part of special permit submittal. Two. Exemptions. A. The concept plan is not required when the site plan submitted with a special permit application includes all proposed uses and development in the entire AO phone. B. The concept plan is not required when the proposed development is restricted to an existing structure and development directly related to such structure, parking, landscaping, signs, etc. 3. Procedure. The following procedure shall apply when an applicant seeks approval only of a concept plan. A. Application. The applicant shall file with the board an application for concept plan approval on such form as provided by the board, and such application shall be governed by the requirement section 7.2. B. Elements of concept plan. The concept plan shall be prepared by an engineer, architect, or landscape architect, and shall include 1. Drawings at a scale of 1 inch equals 100 feet. 2. Existing topography with two foot contours to show the general gradient of the site, existing structures, existing roads, and rights of way, major topographic features including wooded and open areas, ledge or outcroppings, inland wetlands, watercourses, and floodplain. Three, the land uses and zoning within 300 feet of the site. Four, boundary description of the district within it. Five, names of all abutting property owners. 6. The location of all proposed roadways, parking areas, setbacks, easements, land use areas, open space areas, and access locations from connecting roads and driveways within the site to the existing public road system. 7. The site shall be divided into general land use areas, identified as one or more of the specially permitted uses, e.g. retail, restaurant, office, research lab, etc. 8. Proposed building footprints and location of parking areas. 9. Letters from the Water Department and the Water Pollution Control Authority stating how service is to be provided to the proposed land uses. 10. A preliminary traffic analysis prepared by a professional engineer which shall include but not be limited to the following. A. Land use site and study area boundaries. B. Existing and proposed site use. C. Existing and proposed roadways and intersections. D. Existing and proposed roadways and intersection capacities and volumes. E. Trip generation and design hour volumes. 
F. Trip distribution. G. Trip assignments. H. Existing and projected traffic volumes. I. Levels of service of all affected intersections for the design hour. J. Future traffic impact analysis. 1. Short-term horizon, 1 year after occupancy. 2. Long-term horizon, 20 years after occupancy. 11. A preliminary stormwater discharge plan prepared by a professional engineer, which shall include as a minimum the following. A. A map showing project location, description of the property, acreage, topography, identification of major drainage ways involved, proposed type of development, identification of wetlands based on soils, map, and a reference to any flood hazard area delineation study applicable to the site. B. A map of the tribute drainage basin determining the location and magnitude of flows from upstream of the site based on current development or zoning, whichever provides the highest runoff volumes. C. A conceptual drainage plan showing how intercepted and on-site flows will be received and transported. D. Designated points of discharge from the site, accompanied by a general analysis of how existing downstream facilities will handle this discharge. E. Proposed rights-of-way required for drainage easements and detention areas. F. Stormwater storage volume required. G. Location of storage areas. 12. Narrative and illustrative elevations of design elements explaining how various design elements, landscaping, architecture, signage, street design, etc., contribute to a unified appearance that is harmonious both internally and with surrounding properties in terms of scale, materials, and color. 13. A table indicating the following. A. Areas of the site for each proposed land use. B. The amount of building floor area proposed for each land use. C. Number of parking and loading spaces for each land use. D. Wetland areas, floodplains areas, area of ledge or outcroppings. E. Overall lot coverage. F. And building heights. 14. Limits of phases where development is proposed in phases. 15. Such other relevant information as the applicant may wish to submit or the board may request. 4. Required findings. In approving a concept plan, the board shall find A. The application and concept plan are complete. B. That the proposed location of the land use areas on the site of avoids placement of incompatible uses adjacent to one another. C. That the transition between the different proposed uses is suitable and that adequate buffering is provided. D. That the proposed land uses and development patterns satisfy the purpose and intent of the regulation as set forth in Section 1 and the standards and requirements of Sections 5 through 6. 5. Changes to concept plan. Changes to an approved concept plan are required to be approved by the planning board. D. AO fold special permit application. 1. A special permit application in conformity with section 2.5, which includes submission of a site plan as outlined in section 2.6, is required for each proposed use. A special permit application is also subject to the following requirement. A. Concept plan. A concept plan must be submitted with the special permit applications for proposed use or uses if not previously submitted. The board shall act on the concept plan prior to acting on a special permit application. B. Traffic report. Report prepared by a professional traffic engineer stating that traffic conditions as described in the approved concept plan traffic report have not changed or if they have in what way c a tabular statement of zoning conformance with respect to each land use type contained on the concept plan d in addition to the criteria for special permit approval the requirements and findings of this section must be met two changes to special permit site plan changes to an approved special permit site plan are to be approved by the board three change in uses within existing structures is also permitted for situations where a use has already been approved in accordance with these bylaws upon review and approval by the planning board when such use does not change the compatibility of such new use with those existing within the structure and the change in use does not result in expansion of space greater than 25 percent or 5,000 square feet whichever is greater a the development review team will review and will forward any such request to the board for approval b the development review team may require such information as it deems appropriate to evaluate any such application including those listed in subsection c of this section c the town planner shall make a report of any decisions made under this section to the board at the next regular meeting of the board following such decision. That's it. Thank you. Thank you. The reading. I hope, the reading. The, I hope you could all hear that. I, I wasn't sure. But. Yeah, you can hear it. It was fast, right. but we can read it. Mm -hmm. I spelled uh, it up a little Yep. So that was the reading of the amendments to the Selfish Zone and Bylaw introduced in Section 93, American Local Flex Overlay Zone. The third and final reading on 2020 
the public this bylaw zoning bylaw amendment as well as the next one 9.4 globe village flex overlay zone can be found on the town of Southbridge website by going to the planning board link under boards and committees the planning board and the final draft of these two zoning bylaws are attached to um, that also for the record because somebody had brought up public um brought up whether we have final 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 following our requirement on posting this information on a section 1-107 publication of general bylaws at least 10 days before final passage of a general bylaw except an emergency bylaw notice of such bylaw shall be published once in a local newspaper and posted on the town bulletin board such proposed bylaw shall also be posted in full on the town website and be available in the office of the town clerk. For a matter of record, the town council held a joint public hearing where we announced the mission of section 9.3 American Optical Flex Overlay District and 9.4 Globe Village Flex Overlay District, as well as amendments to section four use regulations joint hearing with the town council. That hearing, public hearing, to announce that we were making these changes was conducted on Wednesday, November 18th, 2020, thus well in advance of 10 days of publication. And these bylaws have been attached to our website since that day. So therefore, I believe we are in compliance with those regulations. If somebody has difference of opinion, let me know so that we can read that. But, uh, with that interpretation, it just says that you have to publish it. It also says that bylaw that has to be published on this section shall be performed for the benefit of the public solely for the purposes of information and to make it the public aware of the general nature of certain subject matter the town council may consider at a future meeting notice publication produce posting of this section is not intended except to suggest the measure will be adopted in that precise form that it will be adopted with amendments or that it will be adopted at all, notwithstanding any amendments which may be made to the proposed general bylaw by the town council, the proposed bylaw or notice thereof will not be republished or reposted before final enactment unless at least three councilors vote to require the same. Failure to comply with these provisions of the section shall not invalidate any bylaw enacted by the town council. So just as a matter of transparency and public record. We will take comments on any if anybody from the public wishes to uh, comment on any of these amendments or wish for us to consider any changes to this, please notify one of the town councilors. Does any other council have any other questions on this amendment? And none. Amendments to the Zubber Zoning Bylaw introduced and added in Section 9 for Global Village Flex Overlay Zone. Council Marchetti, do you have a second one? I do. It's this, uh, almost exact, uh, except that it's changed to GV fold. Am I still a presenter? Yeah, I haven't changed it. Um, Just for the public, the only change is the fact the name of the district, correct? There's a few other changes as well. Okay. Well, it is a reading, so Okay. Um, Not sure how to get myself. Oh, here, never mind. I got it. Section 9.4, Low Village.
Flex Overlay District. Section 9.4.1 Intent A. The intent of the Globe Village Flex Overlay District, here and after referred to as GB Fold, is to provide the opportunity to fully utilize former mill structures and related properties that are part of the town's landscape, character, and history. They are also places of economic activity and economic opportunity. Specifically, this bylaw is intended to 1. Provide maximum flexibility for the development and enhancement of GV Fold properties. 2. Retain the potential for business and industrial development while permitting residential development. 3. Foster a greater opportunity for creative development which encourage a mix of uses, residential, commercial, and industrial. 4. Enhance business vitality and provide employment opportunities. 5. Enhance and protect the town tax revenues and 6. Encourage the development of flexible space for small and emerging businesses. Section 9.4.2 General Requirements A. All uses shall be served by public water and sewer. The requirement for public water may be waived in whole or in part by the board if the applicant can establish to the satisfaction of the planning board that portable water requirements can be realized through on-site system. A request for a waiver shall be submitted in writing by the applicant at the time application is made. The request shall detail the extent of the waiver requested and contain sufficient data for the board to make the findings required above. The applicant shall submit a written report on the adequacy of the proposed alternative water supply system of each proposed building lot and or use prepared by a professional engineer licensed to practice in the state of Massachusetts certifying either that each lot and or use is satisfactory for private water supply systems constructed in accordance with the standards of the state of Massachusetts or specifying the location or conditions under which such systems would meet such standards. Approval by the Board of Health is necessary prior to approval of any waiver. B. All developments shall be reviewed for compatibility with the Southbridge Master Plan and be supportive of the public health, general welfare, and safety of the community, including adequate provisions of public facilities and a minimum number of access points on existing roads. C. The Board may, at its discretion, hire a third-party consultant, also acceptable to the applicant, to aid the Board in its review of any proposed use or site. The fees charged by the third-party consultant shall be borne by the applicant. D. Uses currently allowed by special permit may continue. Uses allowed by right in the underlying zone may be developed by the securing of a site plan review through the planning board. Any changes to a special permit use will require a new special permit complying with these bylaws. Section 9.4.3 Allowable uses by special permit. A. All commercial and residential uses not prohibited under Section 9.4.4 subject to the performance and compatibility standards in Section 9.4.5 of this section and the application and permitting requirements of subsection 9.4.6 are permitted by special permit. B. Within the GV fold, there should be no restriction on combining different categories of use, provided such uses conform with the compatibility and performance standards found in Section 9.4.5 within the same building, except any imposed by the State Building Code or other federal, state, or local bylaws. C. An erosion and sedimentation control plan shall be required when the proposed development will result in a disturbed area that is cumulatively more than one-half acre in size, or when the board determines that special site conditions warrant such a plan. Section 9.4.4 Prohibited Uses A. Adult Entertainment Uses B. Animal Sales on Properties of Less Than 5 Acres C. Animal Agriculture on Properties of Less Than 5 Acres D. Automobile or Truck Sales E. Camps Day Slash Boarding F. Cemeteries G. Collection centers. H. Dog kennels. I. Drive up services associated with any commercial use other than bank. J. Golf course. K. Letting of room. L. Rooming and or boarding house excluding dormitories for educational use. M. Seasonal camping slash tents. Section 9.4.5. Performance and compatibility standards. A. Compatibility. 1. All new uses shall demonstrate to the satisfaction of the board that any such new uses, in addition to meeting the requirements of this section, are compatible with all existing uses. A. Any new buildings or accessory structures shall relate harmoniously to each other with adequate light, air circulation, separation between buildings, and to the extent practicable, shall be in harmony with the existing district. B. Building or structures that are listed on the National Register of Historic Places shall be converted, constructed, reconstructed, restored, or altered to maintain or promote the status of a building or structure on the state or National Register of Historic Places. B. Access and traffic impacts. 1. Traffic and safety impacts to the existing and proposed roads shall be minimized. 2. Access shall be provided to the extent feasible through an existing street or driveway. Curb cuts shall be limited. 3. Pedestrian and vehicular traffic shall be separated. 4. Walkways shall be provided for access to adjacent properties and between businesses. C. 
C. Nuisance avoidance. 1. Uses shall cause no inherent and recurring generated vibration perceptible without instruments at any point between two or more uses or along a property line. Temporary construction is excluded from this restriction. 2. Smoke shall not be visible beyond a shade or darker than number 1 on the Ringelmann smoke chart. 3. Heat and glow generated from within a structure or use shall not be discernible from the outside of any structure. 4. Odor, dust, and fumes shall be effectively confined to the premises or so disposed as to avoid air pollution. 5. No activities involving bulk storage or manufacture of materials or products that could decompose by detonation shall be permitted. These materials include primary explosives such as lead, azide, fulminates, lead, siphonate, and tetracine. High explosives such as TNT, RDX, HMX, PETN, and picric acid propellants and their components such as dry nitrocellulose, black powder, boron hydrides, and hydrazine and its derivatives, pyrotechnics and fireworks such as magnesium powder, potassium chlorate, potassium nitrate, blasting explosives such as dynamites and nitroglycerin, unstable organic compounds such as acetylides, tetrazoles, and ozonides, strong oxidizing agents such as liquid oxygen, perchloric acid, perchlorates, chlorates, and hydrogen peroxide in concentrations greater than 35% and nuclear fuel fuels, fissionable materials and products and reactor elements such as uranium 23s and plutonium 239. Utilization of the materials included in this, in this section shall be limited to the minimum quantities necessary for specific research and only after the procurement of all required local, state, and federal permits, material type, quantity, storage, handling procedures, and location in the fa facility shall also be registered with the fire department, police department, and the Southridge Planning Board. All local, state, and federal disposal procedures must be followed. 6. Any electrical radiation shall not adversely affect at any point any operations or any equipment, including not only professional research equipment, but also equipment reserved for personal uses, such as reception of public radio transmissions, use of cellular phones, etc., except equipment belonging to the creator of the electrical radiation. All FCC rules and regulations must be followed. 7. No use abutting residential use shall engage in or cause very loud activities, as defined in the Town of Southbridge Code of Ordinances, Section 7. 7-503 between the hours of 9 p.m. of one day and 7 a.m. of the following day. 8. Non-residential uses shall be designed, constructed, and operated in hours of operation limited where appropriate, so that neighboring residents are not exposed to offensive noise, especially from traffic or late night activity. No amplified music shall be audible to neighboring residents. 9. Common walls between residential and non-residential uses shall be constructed to minimize the transmission of noise and vibration. D. Lighting. A lighting plan allowing existing and proposed exterior lighting, including building and ground lighting, locations, supports, mounting heights, and orientation of all luminaires and light distribution pattern is required. 2. Parking areas and pedestrian facilities shall be illuminated to provide appropriate visibility and security during hours of darkness. 3. Exterior lighting shall be architecturally integrated with the building style, material, and colors. 4. Exterior lighting of the building and site shall be designed so that light is not directed off the site, including above the site and the light source is shielded from direct off-site viewing. 5. Fixture mounting height should be appropriate for the project and the setting. Use of low bollard type fixtures 3 to 4 feet in height is encouraged as pedestrian area lighting. The mounting height of fixtures in smaller parking lots or service areas should not exceed 16 feet with lower mounting heights encouraged, particularly where adjacent to residential areas. 6. Raised light pole bases shall be attractively designed and well detailed to be compatible with the overall project. 7. The use of vandal resistant well lighting is encouraged for lighting monument signs. E. Residential use restriction. 1. Residential buildings to be constructed or rehabilitated shall be designed to filter out noise and vibration through construction, employing but not limited to such techniques as applying soundproofing material between dwelling units laterally and vertically and between different uses, employing staggered joists and insulation. 2. Residential density will be limited to the density of the abutting residential zone districts when within 50 feet. When two or more districts abut a GV fold project, the highest allowable density shall prevail. 3. Residential uses, apartment and condominium units, shall be permitted in existing structures and shall consist of not less than 500 square feet of livable space. F. Buffers, density, and height. 1. Where a GV fold property abuts a residential 
residential zone property, a buffer strip of 75 feet shall be required for any new non-residential development. Such buffer shall be planted with year-round screening vegetation adequate to buffer the view from the residential zone. Preservation of existing trees and vegetation is preferred where they provide desired screening. Two, to reduce the bulk and area of buildings and pavement relative to the overall size of the development and to provide landscaped areas for visual and sound buffers, increased groundwater recharge, and reduced stormwater runoff. The total area of any GV fall that may be covered by buildings and paved surfaces shall not exceed 50%. The board may allow by special permit an increase to a maximum of 60% impervious coverage. When the board finds that one or more of the following benefits of the development outweigh the impacts of the increased impervious coverage. A. The use of grass slash pavement block systems or similar treatment reduces stormwater runoff and or B. The development achieves an overall benefit to the community such as elimination of blight conditions, preservation of historic structures, closure of excessive curb cuts, provisions of inter-parcel access or service roads or similar benefit. 3. Maximum building heights for new construction shall be as follows. A. Residential. 35 feet may be higher upon approval by the fire chief and the planning board. B. Commercial, 60 feet. C. Industrial, 60 feet. D. Mixed use, 60 feet. 4. For existing structures. A. Telecommunication facilities, water tanks, solar collection systems, similar structures and necessary mechanical appurtenances may be erected on an existing structure to a height greater than the limit established for the GV fold, provided that no such exception shall cover at any level more than 25% of the area of the roof on which it is located. Located, except for a solar collection system which may cover more than 25% of the area of the roof on which it is located if the architectural design and layout is compatible with that of the structure to which it is affixed and generally in keeping with the character of the neighborhood in which it is to be situated and provided further that no such exception shall be used for residential, commercial, or industrial purposes other than such as may be incidental to the permitted use of the main structure. B. Roof structures and or roof lines may be integrated together where more than one roof line or roof style is present. 5. The height limitations of these bylaws for new construction shall not apply to chimneys, cables, cupolas, spires, water towers, flagpole, transmission towers and cables, radio or television, tenny or towers or telecommunication service facilities, provided that the telecommunication facility and its antennas or associated equipment does not extend more than 5 feet above the highest point of the building or structure to which it is attached. G. Outdoor storage and sales display. 1. Except as specified below, outdoor storage or display of goods shall be enclosed within permanent walls or fences integrated into the design of the building. A. Storage or display racks and goods thereon shall not exceed the height of screening walls or fences. B. Goods shall not be displayed in landscaped areas on external walls or in parking lots. C. The board, at its sole discretion, may permit the outdoor display and sale of merchandise on sidewalks if a written request accompanies the application stating the nature of the outdoor sales, including the location, duration, and types of merchandise to be sold. D. Outdoor display areas shall be delineated on the site plan and or concept plan and shall not impede the normal use of sidewalks or other pedestrian walkways. E. No vending machines shall be allowed outside of any buildings. F. All materials, supplies, and equipment shall be stored in accordance with fire prevention standards of the National Board of Fire Underwriters and shall be screened from view from public ways and abutting properties. H. Waste disposal. 1. Garbage or recycling dumpsters slash compactors shall have doors or lids that shall remain closed when not being loaded or unloaded and shall be contained in masonry enclosures supplemented with landscaping if necessary. 2. No delivery, loading, trash removal, compaction, or other similar operations shall be permitted between the hours of 8 p.m. and 6 a.m. unless the applicant submits evidence that sound barriers between all areas for such operations effectively reduce noise emissions. I. Signs. 1. Signs shall conform to section 8.9 for each use on the site and, in addition to those requirements, the following. A. All signs shall be architecturally integrated with their surroundings in terms of size, shape, color, texture, and lighting so that they are complementary to the overall design of the building and are not in visual competition with other signs in the area. B. Signs shall be proportionate to the dimensions of their location. C. All signs shall complement their surroundings without competing with each other, shall convey their message clearly and legibly, shall be vandal-proof and weather-resistant, and if illuminated, shall not be overly bright for their surroundings. All signs, save for wayfinding signs, must be externally lit. D. Exterior lighting of the building and site shall be designed so that light is not directed off the site and 
the light source is shielded from direct off-site viewing. E. New signs proposed for existing buildings shall provide a compatible appearance with the building signage of other tenants. With multiple signs on a single building, attempt to bring in a unifying element, such as size, even where no sign program exists. F. New construction design shall anticipate signage and, where necessary, a sign program. New building design should provide logical sign areas, allowing flexibility for new users as the building is retenanted over time. Designs which provide for convenient and attractive replacement of signs are encouraged. G. The use of roof signs shall be prohibited. H. Freestanding signs shall not be greater than five feet in height. Monument sign materials shall reflect the character of the use and the building the sign identifies. I. Freestanding sign bases shall be made of permanent durable materials such as concrete or brick. Bases made of texture coated sheet metal are discouraged. J. Landscaping and irrigation shall be designed on the base of freestanding signs to create the sign with the ground plane and screen out any low-level flood lights. Irrigation shall be designed so it does not damage the sign. K. Freestanding signs on poles which have a top-heavy appearance are discouraged. L. Driveway directional signs shall only be used for projects where circulation is complex and the traffic must proceed through the site along a specific path for service. Where the layout of the parking lot and driveways are obvious and clearly apparent to the driver entering from the street, directional signage is not appropriate. When not appropriate, or needed, such signage can visually clutter the site and will be discouraged. M. Any external spot or flood lighting shall be arranged so that the light source is screened from direct view by passersby, and so that the light is directed against the sign and does not shine into adjacent property or blind motorists and pedestrians. J. Landscaping requirements. 1. Existing trees shall be maintained as practicable, and any new trees shall be carefully selected and located where they will complement the building elevation and shall not block all retail storefront signage from view. 2. Screening of mechanical equipment, trash, and loading areas shall be provided through the use of walls, fences, and or dense evergreen plant materials. 3. Landscaping and screening plant materials should not encroach on the public walkways or roadways in a way that impedes pedestrian or vehicular traffic. 4. Shrubs or trees that die shall be replaced within one growing season. 5. All new plant materials shall be sized so that the landscaping has an attractive appearance at the time of installation and a mature appearance within three years of planting. 6. All proposed shrubs except accent, color, or ground cover planting shall be a minimum of five gallon size. Shrubs and ground cover plants shall be spaced close enough to to ensure an attractive and mature planting effect. 7. Energy conservation within structures shall be addressed by recognizing the sun exposure on the site and providing or maintaining appropriate tree species. Deciduous trees on the southern exposure, coniferous and broadleaf evergreen trees along the eastern and western exposure, and evergreens along the northern exposure. 8. Tree species, when additional trees are proposed, should be selected with root growth habits that will not cause damage to sidewalks, or such tree species shall be sited away from such landscaped areas. 9. Landscaping plans shall show all obstructions such as street light meters, backflow devices, utility covers, transformers, and similar objects which may affect plant placement and installation limitations. 10. When constructing new landscape planting areas on services which were previously covered by pavement or structure, all existing asphalt, base rock, or other deleterious materials shall be removed to the depth of the native soil and clean soil shall be used to backfill the planting area. 11. All exposed dirt areas shall be covered with bark or mulch or other weed control measures, including as part of final landscape. 12. Street tree placement shall include consideration for vehicle line of sight, entrance and exit curb cuts, street light and traffic control devices, and other site-specific conditions as part of design review process. 13. First year plantings must be watered weekly throughout the growing season. K. Parking and loading areas. 1. Parking shall conform to Section 7.1 and additionally shall meet the following standards. A. Parking lots shall provide well-defined routes for vehicles, delivery trucks, and pedestrians. B. Loading areas visible from public street or adjacent property shall be screened with masonry walls supplemented by landscaping if necessary. C. To the maximum extent feasible, landscaped islands with raised curves shall be used to define parking lot entrances, the ends of parking aisles, and the location and pattern of primary driveways and to provide pedestrian walkways where where appropriate. D. Parking areas shall be screened from adjacent residential uses, streets, and walkways using trees and shrubs adapted to the region of specimen quality conforming to the American Standard for Nursery Stock, American Standards Institute Incorporated, 230 Southern Building, Washington, D.C., 20005, and shall be planted according to accepted horticultural standards. Berms may be used for screening along the street in conjunction with plant materials. E. Where a mix of uses creates staggered peak periods of parking demand, shared parking 
parking calculations shall be submitted to reduce total required parking. A reserve area for future development shall be provided on the site plan. F. The use of porous pavement and or perforated brick or block shall be used to the extent feasible to increase on-site water retention for plant material, groundwater supplies, and to reduce problems associated with runoff. G. Within the town's right-of-way, all curbing shall be constructed of granite. L. Medical and or biological research. 1. In the establishment, operation, and design of medical and biological research laboratories and facilities with standards and procedures, as amended, of the National Institute of Health, Bethesda, Maryland, and Centers for Disease Control will apply. No facility shall contain or conduct research involving biological safety level 3 or the equivalent term risk group 3 classification or higher. Section 9.4.6. Applications and permit procedures. A. Before an application is made, it is suggested that the applicant become familiar with the bylaws contained in this section, as well as those contained in Section 2.5, which addresses special permits, and Section 2.6, which addresses site plan, and consult with the development review team prior to the planning board for other bylaws to consider and for any clarifications. B. There are two application procedures for development in the GV fold. 1. A concept plan application for the entire GV fold without a special permit application for specific land uses to be reviewed by the development review team and presented to the planning board for review and comments and two, a special permit application for each proposed use within the GV fold. C. Concept planned application. One. Purpose. The concept plan is intended to illustrate the general development plan and expected land uses without requiring the detail and expense of the site plan required as a part of special permit submittal. Two. Exemptions. A. The concept plan plan is not required when the site plan submitted with a special permit application includes all proposed uses and development in the entire GV fold. B. The concept plan is not required when the proposed development is restricted to an existing structure and development directly related to such structure, parking, landscaping, signs, etc. 3. Procedure. The following procedure shall apply when an applicant seeks approval only of a concept plan. A. Application. The applicant shall file with the board an application for concept plan approval on such form as provided by the board, and such application shall be governed by the requirement section 7.2. B. Elements of concept plan. The concept plan shall be prepared by an engineer, architect, or landscape architect, and shall include 1. Drawings at a scale of 1 inch equals 100 feet. 2. Existing topography with two foot contours to show the general gradient of the site, existing structures, existing roads, and rights of way, major topographic features including wooded and open areas, ledge or outcroppings, inland wetlands, watercourses, and floodplain. Three, the land uses and zoning within 300 feet of the site. Four, boundary description of the district within it. Five, names of all abutting property owners. 6. The location of all proposed roadways, parking areas, setbacks, easements, land use areas, open space areas, and access locations from connecting roads and driveways within the site to the existing public road system. 7. The site shall be divided into general land use areas identified as one or more of the specially permitted uses, e.g. retail, restaurant, office, research lab, etc. 8. Proposed building footprints and location of parking areas. 9. Letters from the Water Department and the Water Pollution Control Authority stating how service is to be provided to the proposed land uses. 10. A preliminary traffic analysis prepared by a professional engineer which shall include but not be limited to the following. A. Land use site and study area boundaries. B. Existing and proposed site use. C. Existing and proposed roadways and intersections. D. Existing and proposed roadways and intersection capacities and volumes. E. Trip generation and design hour volumes. F. Trip distribution. G. Trip assignments. H. Existing and projected traffic volumes. I. Levels of service of all affected intersections for the design hour. J. Future traffic impact analysis. 1. Short term horizon, one year after occupancy. 2. Long term horizon, 20 years after occupancy. 11. A preliminary stormwater discharge plan prepared by a professional engineer, which shall include as a minimum the following A. A map showing project location, description of the property, acreage, topography identification of major drainage ways involved, proposed type of development, identification of wetlands based on soils map, and a reference to any flood hazard area delineation study applicable to the site. B. A map of the trip
tributary drainage basin determining the location and magnitude of flows from upstream of the site based on current development or zoning, whichever provides the highest runoff volumes. C. A conceptual drainage plan showing how intercepted and on-site flows will be received and transported. D. Designated points of discharge from the site, accompanied by a general analysis of how existing downstream facilities will handle this discharge. E. Proposed rights-of-way required for drainage easements and detention areas. F. Stormwater storage volume required. G. Location of storage areas. 12. Narrative and illustrative elevations of design elements explaining how various design elements, landscaping, architecture, signage, street design, etc., contribute to a unified appearance that is harmonious both internally and with surrounding properties in terms of scale, materials, and color. 13. A table indicating the following. A. Areas of the site for each proposed land use. B. The amount of building floor area proposed for each land use. C. Number of parking and loading spaces for each land use. D. Wetland areas, floodplains areas, area of ledge or outcroppings. E. Overall lot coverage. F. And building heights. 14. Limits of phases where development is proposed in phase 15. Such other relevant information as the applicant may wish to submit or the board may request. 4. Required findings. In approving a concept plan, the board shall find a. The application and concept plan are complete. b. At the proposed location of the land use areas on the site of a placement of incompatible uses adjacent to one another. c. That the transition between the different proposed uses is suitable and that adequate buffering is provided. d. That the proposed land uses and development patterns satisfy the purpose and intent of the regulation as set forth in section 1 and the standards and requirements of sections 5 through 6. 5. Changes to concept plan. Changes to an approved concept plan are required to be approved by the board. d. GV fold special permit application. 1. A special permit Permit application in conformance with Section 2.5, which includes submission of a site plan as outlined in Section 2.6, is required for each proposed use. A special permit application is also subject to the following requirement. A. Concept plan. A concept plan must be submitted with the special permit applications for a proposed use or uses if not previously submitted. The board shall act on the concept plan prior to acting on a special permit application. B. Traffic report. Report prepared by a professional traffic engineer stating that traffic conditions at described in the approved concept plan traffic report have not changed or, if they have, in what way. C. A tabular statement of zoning conformance with respect to each land use type contained on the concept plan. D. In addition to the criteria for special permit approval, the requirements and findings of this section must be met. 2. Changes to special permit site plan. Changes to an approved special permit site plan are to be approved by the board. 3. Change in uses within existing structures is also permitted for situations where a use has already been approved in accordance with these bylaws upon review and approval by the planning board when such use does not change the compatibility of such new use with those existing within the structure and the change in use does not result in expansion of space greater than 25 percent or 5,000 square feet whichever is greater a the development review team will review and will forward any such request to the board for approval b the development review team may require such information as it deems appropriate to evaluate any such application including those listed in subsection c of this section C. The town planner shall make a report of any decisions made under this section to the board at the next regular meeting of the board following such decision. And that's it. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor Turner. I mean, Councilor Marchetti. Sorry, Councilor Marchetti. Thank you. Um, so those are the amendments to the separate zone and bylaw. Introduce and add in section 9.4 Globe Village Flex Overlay Zone. I can read it. Of February eighth, two thousand twenty-one. The third and final reading will be March, uh, February twenty-second, two thousand twenty-one. Um, again, for the public, may be found through the planning board um, link under final draft Globe Village Flex Overlay District. Any comment by council? And now we'll move over to amendments to the Suffrage Zone and Bylaw Section Four Use Regulations, including Table One, Table of Uses. First reading of uh, February, uh, January 25th, 2021. This is the second reading. So, Matt Petty, you have this one as well. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. On this one, I only read the changes. I think Councilor Steves has a question. Councilor Steves. Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I just wanted to point out that in our packets, we did not get the revised version that, that actually puts the table into plain English that we asked for. Remember, he, remember um, Eric had raised the concern that if you'd say you could send it over, 
in uh, Word, it would probably be clean, and we still have the, the old version that was all messed up. Okay. Eric, do you have that included? I do. It um, It is available on the town website um, under the planning board link, and it is correct there. Uh, again, I'm, I, I'm terribly sorry. I thought I had sent that over to you. I have the printout, Eric, from you. Thank you, Councillor. Yeah, I think I have the original text, too, somewhere. But I just wanted to point that out, that the, the one that we got in our electronic packet is still the messed up one. Yeah, it is. Could you also make sure that you put that up on the ma on the main page of the website so that people can find it, find it easily? They don't have to go digging through a whole bunch of back under underlying pages to find it. And the same way, I think the same should be true for all of the other bylaws as well. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah, I posted though, so I agree. But, okay, do you, do you keep your the first uh, pages, Council Mark? I'm ready. Okay, go. Ahead. Like I said, I only read the changes. All right. You didn't read the whole uh, the whole thing. Just the changes. Okay. If I make any mistakes, just let me know and I'll change it for the next reading. Okay. Southbridge Zoning Bylaws, Section 4, Use Regulations, 4.1, General Provisions. A. No building or structure shall be erected, and no building or structure or land or water area shall be used for any purpose or in any manner except as provided in this Section 4. B. No building permit shall be issued for any use that is subject to Section 2.6 unless a site plan has been reviewed and approved by the Planning Board. C. An accessory use shall not alter the character of the premises on which it is located or have an adverse impact on the surrounding areas. Adding D. Any new construction within the Central Core requires a special permit from the Planning Board. 4.4 .4, Schedule of Uses. A. Table 1 Legend. 1. Y. Permitted by right, but may be subject to site plan review under Section 2.6. 2. SP. Allowed by special permit. Number 3 has been changed from N. Prohibited to Y. Slash SPR. Allowed by site plan review. Number 4 has been added, which is N. Prohibited. For the purpose of this reading, this is the legend of the zoning districts. R1, R2, and R3 are residential. CC is central core. RB is retail business. GB is general business. OR is office research. M is manufacturing. Southbridge zoning bylaws. Table 1. Schedule of uses. Under residential uses, mixed use building. Zone R2 and R3 has been changed from N to SP. Under educational and institutional uses, religious uses, all zones have been changed from Y to Y slash SPR. Under government, public services, utilities, commercial ground mounted solar photovoltaic installation up to 700 kilowatts or on less than five acres. All zones have been changed from Y to Y slash SPR. Commercial ground mounted solar photovoltaic installation larger than 700 kilowatts or on five or more acres with or without battery storage. Zones R1 and OR have been changed from N to SP. Commercial battery storage was added. All zones are SP. Business use. Retail store. Not exceeding 5,000 square feet per retail establishment. Zones CC, RB, and GB have been changed from Y to Y slash SPR. Between 5,001 square feet and 20,000 square feet, zones RB and GB have been changed from Y to Y slash SPR. Retail sale of custom goods manufactured and sold exclusively on the premises, e.g. production and retail space for an artisan, craftsperson, or cabinet maker. Zones GB has been changed from SP to Y slash SPR. Sale of automobiles, boats, motorcycles, trailers, trucks, or farm implements. Monument sales, including showroom and outdoor display of merchandise for sale on the premises. Zones RB and GB have been changed from Y to Y slash SPR. Hospitality food services, entertainment uses, restaurant full service, which may include service and an adjacent outdoor seating area. Zones CC, RB, GB, OR, and M have been changed from Y to Y slash SPR. Takeout food service establishments, such as a deli, pizza shop, bakery, ice cream shop, no drive through service. Zone CC has been changed from Y to Y slash SPR. Refreshment stand, drive-in or other food service establishment, where food or beverages are served inside a building to persons 
standing or seated outside. Zones CC, RB, and GB have been changed from Y to Y slash SPR. Indoor commercial entertainment facilities such as a cinema, bowling alley, skating rink, or other enclosed place of assembly operated for profit. Zones RB and GB have been changed from Y to Y slash SPR. Zone OR has been changed from SP to Y slash SPR. Office and related uses. Professional or business office. Zone R3 has been changed from N to SP. Zones RB, GB, OR, and M have been changed from Y to Y slash SPR. Medical or dental office or office of allied health care professionals. Zones RB and GB have been changed from Y to Y slash SPR. Bank. Zones CC, RB, GB, and OR have been changed from Y to Y slash SPR. Trade and service establishments. Personal service establishments, such as a barber or beauty shop, tailor or dressmaker, dry cleaning or laundry drop-off slash pickup, photography studio. Zones CC, RB, and GB have been changed from Y to Y slash SPR. Self-service laundromat. Zones R3 and GB have been changed from SP to Y slash SPR. Repair shop for bicycles or small household appliances. Zones CC and RB have been changed from Y to Y slash SPR. Licensed body arts establishment, including retail sales of directly associated items only. Zone GB has been changed from N to SP. Place of business of a builder, carpenter, caterer, electrician, mason, painter, plumber, roofer, or other trade. Zone GB has been changed from Y to Y slash SPR. Zone OR has been changed from SP to Y slash SPR. Wholesale trade storage. Wholesale showroom storage or warehouse or distribution facility for contractors equipment, heating lumber and other bin supplies, livestock feed, fertilizer, food, furniture, hardware, metal, print, consumer commodities, or similar products. Zone M has been changed from Y to Y slash SPR. Outdoor storage yard of any material or equipment of a type permitted to be stored in a warehouse in the same location. Zone M has been changed from Y to Y slash SPR. Automotive and vehicle services and facilities. Commercial parking garage slash lot. Zone CC, RB, and GB has been changed from Y to SP. Zone OR and M have been changed from Y to Y slash SPR. Truck terminal or motor freight station, servicing or parking of trucks, buses, or semi-trailers. Zone OR and M have been changed from Y to Y slash SPR. Manufacturing and related uses. Office or industrial campus master plan. Zone OR has been changed from Y to SP. Research experimental or testing laboratory. Zone OR has been changed from Y to Y slash SPR. Processing, packaging, storage, assembly, or treatment of finished or semi-finished products from previously manufactured or processed materials where such activities are carried out whole within an enclosed building, including incidental storage, sales, or distribution of such products. Zone GB and M have been changed from Y to Y slash SPR. Zone OR has been changed from SP to Y slash SPR. Accessory uses, added, short-term rental, Airbnb, slash VRBO. Zones R1, R2, R3, CC are SP. Zones RB, GB, OR, and M are N. Added boarding house. Zone R1 is N. Zone R2, R3, and CC are SP. Zone RB, GB, OR, and M are N. Outdoor storage of trucks, supplies, and equipment in good working order, incidental to permitted uses. If on a lot abutting a residential district, the outdoor storage shall be screened from view from adjacent properties with evergreen vegetation of sufficient density and height to achieve year-round effective screening. Vegetation shall be maintained in living condition. Privacy, fence, or solid wall may substitute for vegetation, subject to approval by the town planner. Zone GB has been changed from Y to SP. Zone OR and M have been changed from Y to YSPR. And that's that one. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor Marquette. Thank you for doing that. Appreciate it. Um, any questions, comments on section four? Okay. More on to the third reading on 222. Item 24 amendments to the Suffrage for Bylaws, Wetland Protection and Conservation. First reading was January 25th, 2021. This was scheduled at a second reading. Before we begin, I just have some concerns. Uh, Councilor Steves, as I understand this went through your subcommittee through general government. Uh, and looking through the town website, 
I cannot find anywhere on the website that this bylaw for conservation has been posted to the website or that we even posted that we were taking this under uh, any uh, hearing. Do you know if there was a conservation commission hearing on this? Um, there was. Under- but- um, I, I wasn't aware that it wasn't on the website. Um, yeah, there, there okay. was a public hearing on it. When was it back in like bla- like two December's ago? Now wasn't it? It was like in like 2019 or something. Yeah. It was a long time ago. It was ago. A, a long time. It ago. It was a long time ago. Um, but, but and as I recall, I might have been the only person who showed up. They did two or three hearings on it. They did two or three hearings on it. hearing dates on it, and I may have been the only person who showed up to sit yeah. down through part of them. Uh, my uh, question. So, before it came to your subcommittee, before we read, this, I do have a concern that it has not been published up to the website. Okay, I wasn't uh, ready. And uh, uh, can... you asked yeah. Maureen not to talk. Is it? Are you speaking? Yeah. Or sorry please? about that. Okay. Um, now the planning board ones are all there, duly noted, and everything. But the conservation one is not anywhere on this website, or has been published. Nor have we published anything saying that we're making. This bylaw, they could have had a public hearing in 2019, but to bring a bylaw forward to the council with no uh, proper notice, I know uh, there was some conversation at one of your subcommittee meetings that Eric wasn't at it, and then you were going to circle back, and then it came up on the agenda. So I'm a little concerned about proceeding with a second reading tonight. Perhaps we hold off on it, but it's up to the intent of the council. I want to make sure we follow the proper process. But there is absolutely nothing. That makes a lot of sense. I would, I would support that. I, that makes a lot of sense if we didn't even, if I didn't, as I said, I didn't even know it was, wasn't posted on the website because I don't really normally dig through the website to find stuff because I get it. So yeah, that's a good point. Yeah. yeah, I do know that I had asked to make sure that they all went up and I do see the planning board ones that have been there and they've been there since we started the public hearing and everything, but there's nothing to the public that they can actually read this um, outside of us just talking about it. But I think this is an important bylaw that makes a lot of changes, especially with the state and federal laws. I think it would be incumbent on us to make sure that we publish this. I mean, we had the first hearing, so we don't have to circle back to do another reading, but I think we should postpone it to make sure that we get this up uh, to the website, make sure that we advertise it, that it is out there, so that we can have some public comment uh, before we put a bylaw of this nature in place. Council Adams? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Quick uh, comment. I know it went through the plan and development subcommittee back in early 2019, mid 2019, but in the end, it went back to the general gov subcommittee. Um, I do know the plan and development, I believe, voted in favor of it going up to the town council um, for a public hearing, but then it ended up going back to general gov, uh, the wetlands bylaw. I remember that, that, uh, I actually remember that conversation. It was at the same time in the marijuana. That being said, should it be, should another public hearing take place because it went to another subcommittee and it's been so long? It honestly might not be a bad idea. I mean, if we did one with the planning board as a joint public hearing, maybe we should do a joint public hearing with conservation. Yeah, I thought I thought that was the intent. And, um, shame I mean for not following it, but uh, I, I would recommend that it goes back to you for guidance, whether it's a public hearing or not but it should go back uh, for a public hearing you need to leave. Oh, I sorry, should... uh, okay. may, I, may i address that real quick yep so the reason for the joint public hearing between the planning board and the council is because that's a requirement under uh mass general law the wetlands bylaws do not have that requirement um the Conservation Commission actually held two public hearings on this um, because of changes that were requested by the General Gov subcommittee in December of 19. Um, So they made adjustments, held another hearing, and uh, the bylaw was posted on the website. Um, It must have gotten unpublished inadvertently. Uh, I will certainly rectify that first thing tomorrow morning. Um, however, I, I don't know if another public hearing is necessary. Um, like both Councillor Steves and Maureen had said, um, I believe the only individual who attended those hearings was Councillor Steves. Um, 
on both of them, they were properly advertised and they were actually held open for several meetings uh, for the purpose of uh, public input and the commission did not receive any. Okay, fine, but I would just feel more comfortable that uh, we hold it over. Um, we can do uh, the, uh, these last, these three planning board ones for next meeting. We'll hold it over till March. Um, let's do 30 days. We'll hold it over to the meeting in March for the second reading. Get up to the website, advertise that anybody has any review or questions on it that they contact us um, because there's absolutely nothing on the website right now. Yep, that's I don't have an issue with that at all. Okay. I'm sorry. Yeah, I don't know that either, Mr. Chairman. That makes sense. Okay. I'll entertain a motion to postpone till uh, the first meeting in March. I'm not sure what date that is, but would that, is that an agreement? Whatever the first date in March is. Would that, I don't be, have my calendar uh, would that be March 1st, Mr. Chairman, or is that March 8th? I, I'm not Those sure what Monday. meeting. Uh, I don't have my calendar in front of me, but whatever, we'll, it will be it will be postponed to the Let's first see. council meeting in March. Okay. Is there a motion on that? I move. I move. Second. A second. Roll call. Councillor Adams. Yes. Councillor Catrona. Yes. Councillor Daniel. Yes. Councillor Dow. Yes. Councillor Jovan. Yes. Councillor Lazo. I think he dropped off. Oh, okay. Councillor yeah. Marquette. Yes. Okay. Councillor Ryan. Yes. And Councillor Steve. Yes. Okay, and the town manager has that that meeting is March 8th. So, and that'll be for the second reading because we we waived the first reading. It'll be for the second reading. Council Marquette, you already have this taped? Okay, so make I sure do. you save it. Make sure you uh, save it. Okay. Okay. All right. Okay. Moving on. Uh, Council's forum. Council Control. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I'll be brief. Not meaning to be heated this evening, um, and we can all certainly agree to disagree, I hope. Um, I was trying not to be inconsistent with the charter. Um, I, I would certainly ask my fellow counselors to take a look at the charter 2 4 2. It's what I was referring to tonight. It simply says that the council may enact bylaws and other measures and rules and regulations not inconsistent with this charter governing its own proceedings and other matters pertaining to the exercise of its powers and the performance of its duties so it was my opinion that the motion to waive a provision of the charter was out of order that was my opinion uh, because 242 of the charter was very clear. So that was my intention this evening. Um, that's all I have. Thank you. Thank you. Council Marchetti. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I really don't have anything tonight. Uh, everything that I asked of the town manager this week, he got back to me. So I really appreciate you getting back to me in a timely manner. I asked about Mill Street. You got back to me on Mill Street. Um, you, I asked about the dog kennel. You got back to me on that. So I have nothing. Thank you. Okay. Great. Um, Council Ryan? Nothing this evening, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Thank you. Council Steves? Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, just something quick. Uh, when we were talking about item 14, this isn't really... This is more just a, a thought, something to throw out there so we start thinking about this. Um, when we were talking about item 14 on the agenda tonight and all of the various other discussions we've had about funding various things from the fire station project to roads, to schools, to anything else that we also borrow money for, um, we seem to be keep getting tattooed with interest. And I've been, I was thinking that this might be the, a good time to really start thinking about and putting some pressure on our legislator, legislators in Boston and Washington if possible. Um, to start creating public banking because um, we it's because uh, uh, that way we can 
put a, we can save millions of dollars on interest costs for these kinds of really expensive necessary public projects that otherwise would be that is currently being vacuumed into the into private hands whereas the public needs it for all kinds of things like roads and schools and all kinds of other things so i just wanted to throw that out there and uh so i had looked it up a little bit and there's been a couple of efforts to have the an act called the established massachusetts infrastructure bank um it has gone through a couple of legislative cycles now it's currently basically dead in the subcommittee um, but if we can put start putting pressure on our state reps and state legislators and senators to uh, bring it up and actually make it happen, I think it'll benefit all of our communities, not just South Bridge, but all of us spend millions and millions of unnecessary dollars on interest doing trying to do the public's good. And that's all I really wanted to say for tonight. Thanks. Thank you, Councilor Dow. Thank you, Mr. Chair, for you. I just have, you know, I, I'm not sure what the rule is when you uh, take money from the, uh, you know, the, what do you call that, the reversed account, you know, like the, the reserve why account. the money doesn't go back to the account came out for something else in the future, you know, like why the money when it come back from FEMA is going somewhere else, not back to the same account in case we need to use it for something else, you know, same you know, I'm a regency or something. Like why why that money doesn't go back to the same account? You know, I, I'm not sure if I can ask that question. What's the reason they're gonna go back to a different account? I know it's coming back to the town. I know it's coming back, it's not going nowhere, but I think it should go back to that specific account came out from. I, yeah, I'm no expert on municipal finance. Um, we can talk to Karen about it. I mean, we do have our certified free cash that was just certified you know you could talk to the town manager we could as a council discuss it with the town manager if that money's going back to free cash potentially no, i don't mean the free cash I'm, I'm i mean the reason no, no 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 i know so what i'm saying is uh we do have free cash we could transfer a certain amount of free cash uh, from free cash back to our reserve if that money is going back but we can have that conversation on another it's all accounting principles and municipal accounting, but we can have that conversation at another date, I think, on an agenda okay. item. Yep. Thank you. Uh, who do I have left? Council Adams? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Just uh, take my word back here a few minutes ago when we discussed the planning and development. Now that we have a council home meeting on the 16th, and uh, we had scheduled it uh, planning and development possibly at about 6, 6 p.m. I don't think we're going to have enough time to discuss the multiple items that are on the agenda, so we'll have to move that down a couple of days or up a couple of days, but I'll work with the town manager and the uh, and economic team downstairs. So thank you. Thank you. I'll let everybody know when it happens. Thank you. Council Dan. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I have nothing for this evening. The next regularly scheduled meeting is Monday, February 22nd, 2021. Thank you. I'll a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. Roll call. Councilor Catrona? Yes. Councilor Daniel? Yes. Councilor Daniel? No, yes. Councilor Jovan? Yes. Councilor Marchetti? Yes. Councilor Ryan? Yes. Councilor Steves? Yes. And Councilor Adams? Yes. Yeah, have a good evening. Have a good weekend. Good night, night everybody. Thank you.